Hi there, that's Talk Sports fans. Today I'm joined by Dan with me, a New York Mets fanatic. Thanks for coming on today. Well, thank you very much, and it's really nice to be here. And yeah, I'm a Mets fan. I go back to uh, the first game at uh, the Polo Grounds in 1962. So that's how far back I go. I'm an old guy. Well, yeah. Um, well, I've got to be honest with you. Um, I don't know too much about the Mets. Obviously, I've over the last year I've been following them more with some of the moves they've been making. I'm a, more of a fan of baseball, but if I had to say I support one side. I watch a lot of Yankees games, so I'm not strictly speaking a fan, but I sort of have a soft spot for them, if that makes sense. Well, it does, because I do too a little bit, because my dad brought me to my first Yankee game in 1959, and it was a Sunday doubleheader, and you could get into the bleachers in the center field for 75 cents. And then my father didn't like it because there was no shade. So he found a way to pay another 75 cents for each ticket. And we crossed over into the lower right field stands at Yankee Stadium. And we saw a Sunday doubleheader. Each ticket cost $1.50. And Maris and uh, Mickey Mantle was playing and Yogi Berra and the, there was no National League team in New York at the time. And about two or three years later, at 13 and 14 years old, my friends and I could go to Yankee Stadium by ourselves. And we could see the Yankees play. And we would sit upstairs in the top deck for the first game and then ask people for their ticket stubs that were leaving for the second game. And we could sit behind the dugout. And it, it, it was really cool to see Whitey Ford and, as I said, Alston Howard and Moose Skyron and those guys play at Yankee Stadium in the early 60s. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the period I always look at as what you call the golden period of baseball. I mean, um, the, you look back at some of the players at that time and they really there were so many legends of the game back then yes and um you know in that period of time um i don't know if the first game i ever went to was uh, in uh, ebbets field and it was 1956 so in that period of time you had Willie Mays in center field for the New York Giants, Duke Schneider in center field for the Brooklyn Dodgers and uh, Mickey Mantle in center field for the New York Yankees. And you talk about the golden age of baseball, you couldn't ask for a better time. And for a young boy at nine years old to go to Yankee Stadium or Ebbets Field or the Polo Grounds with my father, it was cool. And the first game I went to was camera day and he told me, my father told me, as this play was coming by, we were in the lower left field stands. And we were taking photos. And my father said, I want you to hop the railing and I want to take a picture with you and this player. And I said, Pop, I can't do that. He said, hop the railing. Well, you you got to listen to your father. And I did. And this is the photo of me and Jackie Robinson. When I was a little boy at my first baseball game, at Ebbets Field in the summer of 1956. And from that time on, I became a real baseball fanatic. I liked the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, and from then on, it just metastasized to where I am now I'm watching baseball. Yeah. Well, first of all, there's a lesson that always listen to your father if there's any kids <laughs> out there. And um, also, it's a bit of a coincidence because I was going to say to you before we get on to the Mets, who would you say your favourite all-time player is? And Jackie Robson, Robinson is actually mine just because not just on sporting 
ability which he had in spades and just what he endured as a man and sort of he trailed the way forward for black athletes today and you have to respect that. Yes, and um, the dumb part on my part was I never asked my father why Jackie Robinson? Why did you tell me to hop the railing that time? Because after all, I was taking pictures of Duke Schneider and Carl Ferrillo and Gil Hodges. And, but when, the, when Jackie Robinson came over, my father told me to hop the railing. Now I played baseball and I pitched for close to 55 years in semi-pro teams, amateur teams. And I guess because I never looked at the person's color, I looked at the name on his uniform and we were all teammates or we were just playing against each other to beat your brains out. And uh, that, that, I guess that was the way my father left it with me. And uh, from then on, you asked me about who my favorite player was of all time. Well, Jackie Robinson had to be one because of how I got introduced to him and how he talked to me after this photo was taken. But I guess my favorite player was Sandy Koufax. Um, yeah. I saw him pitch uh, one year in uh, Ebbets Field when he first came up. He was from New York. And then I seen him pitch a number of times when he came to Shea Stadium to play the Mets. I saw him pitch in Memorial Day of 1962. The Dodgers came back to New York for the first time as playing a league game in Memorial Day, which was a doubleheader, and Koufax pitched the first game. And man, he had, and I was a lefty pitcher. And boy, he was my favorite player. Um, but there were so many other wonderful players that played the game with passion. I love the way Mantle played because he was, even though I don't like the Yankees, but he was hurting all the time. And, and Whitey Ford, uh, number 16, just, he didn't throw for speed, he threw for location. So those are some of the plays that I really looked up to. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, the players who I always identify are players around the time of Jackie Robinson and a little bit now. I went off some of the players during the big steroid era just because there's a thing of, well, was it them or wasn't them? And that's the sad thing because even the ones what wasn't doing it, you have that doubt in your mind. So the ones what was doing it has that to answer for, I think, because it's a shame that it's marred their generation. Yes, and I, I think you're 100% correct. But um, being that I'm old <laughs> and a double chin, um, I look back at those guys to watch them play between the lines. Guys like Hank Aaron, uh, Lou Brock, uh, Bob Gibson, uh, Don Drysdale, um, all these players, I look at how they played the game and they played it between the lines. And then they, they went home, they went back and, and they, they didn't be flamboyant and stuff like some of the players are today. I like the way they play. They're better athletes. I think they're trained better. But uh, how they played the game and just low-keyed themselves was really good. Um, so that's, that's my thing. But I always liked the Mets. Um, I went to the first game at the Polo Grounds in 1962. Um, I went to the first game at Shea Stadium on April 17th, 1964. I was at Shea Stadium with my dad on Father's Day of 1964 when Jim Bunning pitched this perfect game. And uh, I was there for the 69 Mets. I came back from college. The tickets were like $12 per ticket. And uh, after that, World Series win, everybody jumped on the field. And it was euphoria because for the couple of years before that, the Mets lost 120 games that first year. They were perpetual losers. Casey Stengel was great as a manager. He made the 
saying let's go Mets and stuff like that. And uh, but when they won in '69 with Gil Hodges, a former Brooklyn Dodger, to win the World Series, that was incredible. And during that period of time, um, you bring that team to heart because you rooted for everybody. There were platoon players, Art Shamsky and, and Ron Swoboda in right field, and sometimes Don Clendenin and Ed Crane pool in first base and so on, Ray Knight and Ed Charles. So, I mean, just not Ray Knight, but Ed Charles at, at third base. And when the game was over, there was so many people on the field I kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit. I wanted to get a piece of the dirt from home plate or something, and I couldn't get there. And I saw Bowie Kuhn, who was the commissioner of baseball with his entourage, walking on the field and walking behind home plate. There was these big wide gates. And he was being escorted off the field. And I was in a sport coat with a turtleneck, and um, I followed them right into the Met locker room. And when you walked into the Met locker room, you didn't want to be out of place. And I saw a phone right in front of me, a wall phone. And it was right next to Gil Hodges' office. And I dialed the number just to call my friend, not to tell him where I was, but to just to get the lay of the land in the locker room. And people were celebrating and stuff. And it was wonderful. I hung up the phone after two minutes and walked in the Met locker room for a few minutes and saw all the players and celebration and stuff. And then I had to get on a plane and go back to college. I mean, um, it's moments like that that you can't, don't forget. And um, that sort of brings me on to my next question. You've already sort of answered this, but is it just that while you was on New York, from New York, why you supported them or was, um, was there another reason as well? No, I, 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 I'm a New Yorker, born and raised in New York City. Um, but I, I, I like other teams. Is that what you're saying? I, 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 yeah. I, I, worked, um, I work for a minor league team right now. It's, a, it's in the Independent Frontier League, Professional Independent Frontier League. I work for the Tri-City Valley Cats. I'm an usher. I wipe down people's seats. And for the last... 13 years I worked for them when they were affiliated with the Houston Astros. And I, I, I watched the Astros because I seen some of their players who came on to the Valley Cats at short season A ball, which is the lowest in the, one of the lowest leagues going, but they just came in out of high school or college or just didn't get moved up to another league and they were playing all league starting in June. Guys like Jose Altuve, George Springer, J.D. Davis, who plays with the Mets now. They all came up. Tony Kemp, what a wonderful individual and gentleman he is. And so is Jose Altuve. So I follow them a little bit. And, and I see some of the players like Alex Delgatti uh, and Gare Kessinger, who are in the minor leagues right now but they play for our team. And yesterday they were all on TV and you see how they are. So I follow the Astros and, um, you know, I know there's a, a, a black mark on them from 2017, uh, but when you meet the players and how good they are as individuals to their minor league teammates and uh, their players, you, you see the passion that they play with. So I follow the Astros, and I, and I like them as well. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You can argue the pandemic is actually almost good for them because by the time there is fans back in, the time what last season would have been a fade tricky time. That's sort of that moment's passed, if that makes sense. It's interesting in that regard it does very much and i'll give you last year uh at today a year ago i flew to florida with a gentleman that was working or that 
uh, would, would work for the Tri-City Valley Cats. He was the media guy. His name was Chris Chinas. But last year, Chris left and he got a new position in New York City. And the Valley Cats, um, I, they gave me an okay to get a, a pass to go down there and, and, and talk to some of the players and get interviews like we did previous years. And um, I went to a Houston Astros Mets game at Port St. Lucie last year. And Altuve was playing, I, I'm trying to think of who else was playing, but you could see and hear uh, the boos that were going out. And I just felt bad because you know these guys and who they are and to get caught up in all of that venue was bad. And I think, I hope this year, um, the fans in Major League Baseball when the Astros do play and whatever they do and some of the players are, are given a little leeway to, because they have to hit the ball anyway, whether or not yeah. something they know or something, they have to catch the ball, they have to know what's coming up. So um, I'm just glad that I, I, I wish them the best this year. Too. Yeah, I mean, I think this is just my personal opinion and uneducated guess. I don't think there'll be too many issues this year because people are just going to be so glad to be back, A, back in the world and B, back at games that that there's been that healing time that I think there will be a little bit of a reaction, but be maybe 10% of what it would have been, say, there hadn't have been the pandemic a year ago. I think you're 100% correct. And I know what Major League Baseball has done to about 40 teams in the minor leagues, and we were one of them. But uh, in speaking to some of the fans of the Tri-City Valley Cats over the course of the last six months or so, and we're getting this team from the Frontier League, and Pete Incavelia will be the manager of the team who played Major League Baseball for a number of years, including hitting a home run for the Phillies in the World Series. Uh, the fans are going to come back to the ballpark. Once it's open, our fans, our loyal fans, fans for life will come back. And I think that's going to happen in the major leagues. You could see it a little bit now in the minor leagues. I mean, in the spring training when some of the fans are, are, are into the stands right now, you can see the how the players react to the fans in the stands. So it's going to be a wonderful time, a wonderful game. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to all aspects of ushering, watching minor league baseball and then going to good old city field and uh, I almost said Shea Stadium. And uh, let me tell you a story about that, um, if you don't mind, about Shea. No, that's fine. Um, I ushered there for a little bit for both the Jets and, and the Mets. And uh, in 2008 was the last game. It was September 28th, 2008. After 44 years, uh, Shea Stadium will be closing. And it was the last game of the season. And the Mets had a big chance to get into the playoffs. But um, C.C. Thabathia was pitching for the Milwaukee Brewers. And he won the game with Milwaukee at the time. And that pushed them up a little bit higher into the Mets, uh, above the Mets. So as the game was winding down, the Mets knew that they weren't going to be in the playoffs. And as the last two innings approached, I was in left field, lower left field stands. And I started to walk towards home plate for the last time. And I photographed it because I do photography. And as I was getting close to the visiting dugout, I saw somebody, some people stand up in the first row, right by the on-deck circle, right behind the on-deck circle and leave. And I've snuck into some great events. And I said, hmm, let me see. So I, they went up. I came down and stayed in the seat. And as the last um, couple outs were coming up, I had my camera and uh, uh, a, a person by the name of Damon Easley was pinch hitting and he was a right-handed hitter. And I was, his back was towards me, his butt and everything. And I said, I can't sh shoot this way, they don't wanna do it get on base because the next batter was a lefty coming up, Ryan Church. And Damon Easley in his last at bat walked and Ryan Church came up and we took three pitches. But I photographed the last pitch 
the last swing and the last out at Shea Stadium with the time and scoreboard and everything behind me. And who was next to me uh, was one of, one of the New York State senators or something like that. And he asked the cop as the game, as the ceremony was going to begin, could I leave by the center, the lower stands behind home plate? There was a gate. I don't want to walk up with all the fans. So the cop allowed him out. He was with two girls, his daughters. And I followed the daughters right on the field and I stayed on the field for the closing ceremonies. And um, I took some wonderful pictures of some of the mats and everything. And I, after that whole ceremony was over, um, I stayed on the field for a little bit. Nobody was chasing me. I had my camera, walked on the mound. Tom Siva came out there and picked up some dirt with his, um, and put it in a cup with his wife, Nancy. Uh, I spoke to him for a couple minutes and then people started to leave. And I was maybe about 15 minutes later, I was the last maybe five or eight people on the field at Shea Stadium for the last time. And I said, how am I going to go home? I, should I go up the stairs and into the stands or let's go via the Met dugout? And I walked through the Met dugout and I took a photo of the Met dugout. I was going down the stairs and I left that way through the ramp past the Met locker room and out Shea for the last time. And that moment in my life, as far as what I started with at 17 years old, and, you know, in the late 60s, uh, at the last game was a remarkable, wonderful experience. Uh, you met some wonderful people there, ushers, police department people, fans, and it was remarkable. And that's why baseball is so cool. You go over and over again, and you see the same people and they become your friends. And it's a little neighborhood. And that's what baseball is about. Yeah, I mean, I think with most sports, there's a sort of bonding experience of all sorts of people from all sorts of life. And whether you're young or old, it's something what you can connect with them and find camaraderie. Yes, and, and the same thing too. Uh, I like um, I like the game of hockey. Um, I went to some in the early '60s. Uh, I didn't miss a Ranger game from 1962 to 1968 at the Old Madison Square Garden. Uh, I got to be friends with some of the players, Eddie Jockerman and Rod Gilbert and Vic Hadfield, and they were just quality people. I mean, you could see from their heart and up here and how they would work with you and talk with you about hockey and stuff. So I went to some wonderful games and then those guys left, they retired and I followed the Islanders in Long Island because I was living out there and I got to know Bobby Nystrom, and, um, Bobby Bourne, and a lot of these players and we would have drinks with them after the game at the Salty Dog, which is a bar right across the street from the Nassau Coliseum. And I was there when the Islanders won their first Stanley Cup and uh, even got into the locker room. But it was, it was a wonderful aspect of sports, starting with baseball, uh, that leads you to other paths. So yeah, it, it's been a wonderful sport life. I, I can't complain about it at all. It's been, you met some wonderful people. Yeah, and I think I'm going to get on to my last question in a minute, but I think everyone needs sports more with the last year. Um, it's that sense of normality, there's businesses struggling, and I think sports could be a way to get the businesses kick them back into gear because people who aren't connected to sports don't realise how many businesses rely on sports. Some people say, oh, well, it's sports. It doesn't matter if it's on or not, but they don't seem to realize there's very small businesses that actually rely on the sports being on a full active diary, I think. Yes, and, and you know, working for the Tri-City Valley Cats for these years, you see how they, the, the salespeople and the marketing people for the teams get companies locally to advertise. 
you get people that, that have businesses that sell to the Valley Cats for food services. You, you go out, the Valley Cat management staff go out to uh, their areas in, in, in the area and, and work with the YMCA, the boys clubs. And that's just minor league. Major league does that too. And I think once uh, people start coming into the stadium again, I think you're going to get a very much of, of a welcome back. But I think the people are going to realize how good the game of baseball is or, or hockey or basketball um, and how they missed it both here and here in their heart. And, and what it meant to, to enjoy a team, to root for a player, to, to see how the progress is of a young player moving up into the system. And knowing that the game of baseball has been around for 100, to, 100 years. And, and to me, um, I've I, I just been so lucky and fortunate to have an opportunity to watch the games, um, to be involved in a minor league just as an usher, but to see how that they conduct themselves in a professional manner and how the fans bring their kids, the grandparents bring their kids to the game and get autographs. And in and, and, and our team, the players would read to some of the younger kids before the game. So, yeah, it, it's going to be good to come back. Uh, spring training is back. Read the box scores, everybody. That's that's an intelligent thing to do if you can. And just look at it from a standpoint of doing that. Uh, if you got one minute, let me show you one of my favorite photos. I snuck in the locker room when the Islanders won their second Stanley Cup. And there was a player, his name was Billy Carroll. He was a third line center, penalty killer, great guy but he had no teeth. And I got into the locker room and I see him. I go, come on, Billy, give me a smile. As Billy Carroll celebrating the Stanley Cup win. And um, I also was fortunate to be at the um, American Russian game in Lake Placid. And I took a number of photos and that was the greatest sporting event I have ever seen and witness the, the best. And, and I, 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 to this day, coming out of that arena in Lake Placid and everybody singing God Bless America walking to Main Street was the most fantastic thing I've ever heard of. And, and I sent some pictures to um, the Miracle on Ice group and Jim Craig was nice enough to send me this back, this photo, and it's addressed to me. And that I'll treasure for the rest of my life because uh, he was a leader. And, and what was good about that team, a lot of guys from Massachusetts, and there was a lot of guys from Minnesota, and they were hockey rivals. And he had great leadership in Herb Brooks. And you got guys in different rival colleges and states to come together for one great win that this team had against the Russians. And perhaps that's the best thing, sporting event I ever witnessed. So that's my story. And um, one last question I wanted to ask you is about your hopes and what you think the Mets would do this year. My the take on it is it's not as educated as yours will be is I think they've certainly done a good job at putting a roster together over the last two years but my only concern is have they done it too quickly that there'll be chemistry issues I think their pitching looks up there with any bullpen in the division and the hitting certainly looks good. What's your take on this? I think they're going to be a very competitive team. Everybody wants to win the World Series. Me, um, let's get the competitiveness and win to get into the playoffs. They have a team to do that. Uh, they forged a little bit more defense up the middle with the catching uh, acquisition of McCann. Lindor at shortstop is, is going to be great. McNeil at second base will fortify that defense up the middle. 
I wish they would have got George Springer. I was hoping they'd get him. After all, he's an old Valley Cat guy from Connecticut. It would have been great. But they, they're they going to have, Nemo's going to play really good. Uh, their starting pitching, I think, will be really good, especially when Noah Syndergaard comes back, hopefully in June. Um, I think it, it comes and, and falls back on their relief pitching with Diaz. He had a good year last year. He came back a little bit better than he did the previous year. Uh, Dylan Betances, uh really has to show up for the games as well as uh, Jerry's familia. But they have other guys in place there that can, can help out as well. Uh, their minor leagues got decimated by the previous general manager. They're working their way back on that now. They're gonna have some young players that are maybe a year or two away. They'll be very competitive. Uh, the big team that you have to watch out for is Atlanta. They really got some some decent pitchers that can fire the rock and pump the seed. And uh, they signed some ball players uh, back up again. And Freddie Freeman's been remarkable. And um, you know, you never know what Philadelphia can do with Harper and Riamito and as a catcher. And they got some good ball players too. So it's going to be a very competitive Eastern Division. But my Mets, let's go Mets. Uh, they should really uh, have a very, very good, strong year. And uh, I'll root hard for them. Yeah, I agree. And I really think that's the perfect place to end it. I'd just like to thank you for coming on today. And I'd love to have you on again in the future. You let me know, and I'd be more than happy to. And I want to thank you very much for the opportunity. I know it's late over there in London and whatnot, but thanks again for doing this. You're, what you're doing is great, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm kudos to you for doing this. So thank you very much, sir. No, thank you for coming. And everyone, thanks for listening. And until next time, let's talk sport, fans.